All right, we're ready to go. Welcome, everyone. So good to have you here. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, this presentation will be filmed as well. It's being transported around the world in real time. We begin with Jennifer Morgan, and her title of her talk is Shaping Noospheric Adults from Early Childhood Through Secondary Level. Jennifer Morgan is the president and founder of the Deep Time Network, vice president of the American Teilhard Association, and is a recognized author, stellar, storyteller, and educator. Her universe story trilogy, comprising Born with a Bang, From Lava to Life, and Mammals Who Morph is widely used in classrooms worldwide, particularly in Montessori schools as part of the cosmic education curriculum. The trilogy has earned accolades such as Teacher's Choice Award, Nautilus semifinalist, highest rankings from AAAS, and endorsements from notable figures like Jane Goodall, Neil deGrasse Tyson, astronaut Edgar Mitchell, philosopher and theologian Thomas Berry. Please join me and welcome Jennifer to our podium. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you, Ben. And I'm so excited to see many, many dear friends here who I've known through the internet but never actually met. And it's very, very exciting to be here. So I'm gonna talk about shaping noospheric adults from early childhood through the secondary level. And this focus particularly will be on Montessori cosmic education. Oh, oh wow. Uh -huh. Oh, great. Um, show of hands, how many of, now I know everybody knows Montessori, but how many of you are familiar with Montessori cosmic education, the specific cosmic education curriculum? Oh, okay, quite a few hands. Great, not everybody. And I do have to point out right over at that table, right over there, Kyle and Jana Herman are Montessori teachers and trainers. Extraordinary. Thank you so much for coming. Yay. <laughs> okay, so here we are at this conference, and we're talking about this idea of a superorganism, and we're excited about it. You know, we're engaged in, I would call it an adventure, a cosmic, and there's a little bit of a, does everybody hear that sound that I'm hearing? I don't know, uh, Devin, if you can to lower that sound. That's better. That's better. Thank you. Um, a super artist, and we're excited about it. It's like we're part of an adventure. But a lot of the world is not feeling good and not feeling like part of a grand adventure. In education today, it's much more characterized by, I would say, radical separation. And it's a sense of fragmentation, a sense of alienation, depression. Fragmentation, because subjects are all taught as just fragments, but they're never put together into a transdisciplinary context. The alienation is there because people don't have a sense of purpose. That's not coming out of education, a sense of purpose. There's depression, there's a sense of hopelessness. Um, I certainly encounter this all the time with young people. And many of us have heard the statistic that um, in young people ages 10 to 24, the second leading cause of death is suicide. Can you imagine? Suicide. Something's wrong. Now, an antidote, one among many, though I think this is one of the best, is Montessori education. And just to give you a sense of scale, um, talk about a network girdling the earth. Montessori is a significant and resonant force in the whole world. 
Just some statistics, 15,763 schools around the world, 60,000 Montessori teachers in the world. More than a million students have attended a Montessori school. It's huge. This is a huge force in the world. Brian and I have given keynote addresses at the American Montessori Society, and there are thousands of people. You remember, right, Brian? You look out over just this sea of people who are there, taking it in, taking the ideas to their schools, and then in the schools to their parents and the grandparents and the cousins and the aunts and the uncles. And I just have to say one of my sort of missions here is to say for all the academics and so on, to see this as one of the ways to get your ideas out into the world and to really make it real, okay? So this is an amazing place because it's resonant. It's resonant with your ideas. So Maria Montessori, she lived from 1870 to 1952. She was one of the first women medical doctors in Italy. There's a whole story around her becoming a medical doctor. It was an incredible obstacles that she encountered and overcame to become one of the first women medical doctors. And what she learned in that process was the art of observation. And that is just really studying the real world. Not just making up ideas about it, but actually learning, taking the wisdom from the world, really observing it very, very carefully. And what did that do for her? It gave her a breakthrough in the understanding of the consciousness of the child. So the child is not just this empty vessel, you know, with the teacher up at the front, pouring all this information into the empty vessel. No, the child has their own interiority, their own fascinations, their own absorbent mind, where they're absorbing what's around them, and they become absorbed in activities like just this simple thing, like pouring water, pouring water, the simple act of pouring water for a young child is an act of learning. So these kinds of sensorial activities are in the early childhood classroom where the child can repeat the activity over and over and over again. I'm sure that all of you have seen this with your children or with your grandchildren that they do activities and then repeat them because they're learning that way. So it wasn't just the consciousness of the child that she had the insight into. Maria Montessori also was adamant about the spiritual preparation of the teacher. The teacher has to be spiritually prepared to teach you can't just give somebody information and expect them to go off and just pour that in. Our goal is not so much the imparting of knowledge as the unveiling and developing of spiritual energy. So another thing that Maria Montessori observed so carefully was that all children go through stages of development or planes of development, as she called it. And there are three basic categories here. There are subcategories, but I'm just gonna go into basic categories. Zero to six, six to 12, and 12 to 18. In the first, basically 30 years of her life, of her professional life, she focused on the zero to six age group. <clears throat> That's the early childhood. And I'm sure that all of you have seen, you know, Montessori schools that are for the zero to six age group. But then, incredibly, in the 40s, she began to develop cosmic education for the elementary level. That's six to 12. 
a lot of people have no idea about this. It's like one of the best <laughs> kept secrets in the world. I just find this amazing. So how did this happen? Well, she was invited to India by the Theosophical Society, interestingly. And while she was in India, World War II breaks out. And so she and her son, she's sitting, her, the man right behind her is her son, Mario. She and her son, Mario, are put under house arrest in India. That turned out to be the best thing. Why? Because while they were in India, they developed the cosmic education curriculum, drawing upon her um, background as a scientist, scientific observation, her Catholic background, a person of deep faith, and in the context of India, with its grand philosophy. So what did she say? She said, let us give the child a vision of the whole universe, no matter what we touch, an atom or a cell. We cannot explain it without knowledge of the wide universe. Now, why did she choose the elementary level to develop this curriculum? Because she observed through careful study, she observed that at age six, that's when the child asked the question, where do I come from? Where does everything come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? These are all what? Time dimensional questions, right? And they happen at age six. Certainly my son was that way, right on the dot. I mean, you could have set the clock, six o'clock, age six. Where did everything come from? Where does the moon go? Where is, you know, all these questions, time dimensional questions. So with these three planes of development, zero to six, six to 12, and 12 to 18. Each phase goes through a particular characteristics. This first one, zero to six, is the age of the senses, getting to know the world through the senses, touch, taste, smell, everything that's like right in front of you. We've all seen kids do this, put everything in their mouths, right? They're getting to know the world. So each phase, the question is, how is that child getting to know the universe and their place within it? So in this first phase, through the senses, this world of wonder and exploration. Then the second plane, as we just found out, age six, that's when they asked the question, where did everything come from? So Maria Montessori said, ah, they're asking the question about where everything came from. That's the time to tell them <clears throat> the story of the universe. Don't wait until high school. Don't wait, certainly, until college. Tell them in an age-appropriate way when they're asking the question. So that's when the great stories, the cosmic stories are told at the elementary level. Now what's interesting is that the child can learn the story, but they don't see themselves in the story yet. That starts to happen in the adolescent years. And that's why the adolescent years are so, I'd say delicate in a way, because it's scary. All of a sudden you're, like, oh my gosh, I'm actually in the story. I have, it's not just a flat screen story out there. I'm in it. So it's a very, very sort of dangerous time in a way. 
because you begin to realize, do I have a role? Do I have a place? And if you begin to question that, you can see how a lot of pathologies can set in. So what is it, a definition of cosmic education? It's a unitary vision of the universe. We're gonna get into a minute how we go across levels. Two, the universe is evolving. All right, now I want you to think about something. She came out with the book to educate the human potential in 1947. That's uh, where she laid out the cosmic education curriculum. H Hubble proved that the universe was expanding, you know, in 1930, 1929, 1930. She began to create this entire curriculum grounded inside the cosmic story, a story of an expanding universe. <laughs> Within 10 years of, uh, you know, she started the process. Within 10 years of that discovery by Hubble, that's extraordinary. You know, it took so long for most other educators to come anywhere near, and they most even never caught up. <laughs> um, number three, passing from whole to detail. So you start with the big picture, then work down to the details. So the child always gets the big picture, not lots of different fragments, all these subjects that are just like fragments thrown in. First, the big picture, then the details the interdependence of everything. And here's the kicker. What's our job? To participate in evolution. That's our job. She said humans are cosmic agents. Our purpose is to evolve the universe. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? She said that in the 40s. Is anybody astounded here? Yes. <laughs> and she's a woman. <laughs> Sorry, I have to say that. Oh my God. <laughs> um, sorry, get a little excited there. Okay. So. The idea here is we all have a cosmic gift and task. We have gifts. What is a cosmic gift and a task? A cosmic gift and task is a gift that we have that we do because we love it, because we're selfish, we want to do it, but it also is a benefit to the whole. So let's take plants. And here's the thing, it's not just humans that have cosmic gifts and tasks. Everything has a cosmic gift and task. Plants, animals, everything has a cosmic, the whole, our whole earth has a cosmic gift and task. Let yourself think about that for a while. We have a cosmic gift and task as a planet. But let's look at, at plants, for example. Plants break through uh, photosynthesis, they break apart water molecules release that oxygen up into the atmosphere, and then it becomes available to animals. They're doing it for themselves. They're not doing it for the animals, but it has the benefit of offering something to the animals. So you might think for yourselves, what's your cosmic gift and task? You might have several. You might think about that. What am I doing that I really, really love and that is also giving at the same time to the whole? That's where your cosmic gift and task is. So there are five great themes or great stories that extend across all of the levels from zero to six, six to 12, 12 to 18. And guess what? Starts first 
with the story of the universe. That's number one, that's the big one. And then nested inside of that, the story of Earth and life. Nested inside of that, the story of humans. Nested inside of that, the story of communication. Nested inside of that, the story of math. Everything is taught as a story, not static. So for example, this fourth one, communication, that's where reading and writing comes in. That's taught by where the kids learn how to make marks in clay or on trees, the way that humans first learn to write. And then they get the idea, I can write because human beings a long time ago figured this out. They figured it out. This wasn't here all the time. And that turns life into something entirely different, doesn't it? Can you see that? How it's totally different when you realize that everything that we have here today wasn't here at one point. It had to come into being. So all of these great themes and stories provide a scaffolding so that all subjects are in the scaffolding. From the universe, we get physics and chemistry. In Earth life, you get biology, we get Earth science. Humans, we get the story of humans, we get anthropology. And there's a whole amazing unit on human needs, which goes right into cultures and how different cultures answer the questions of human needs. It's a beautiful curriculum. And then communication. Again, this idea of differentiation. Communication is so differentiated by, through an, animals have different ways of communicating and all different cultures have different ways of communicating. And then math is a kind of communication, kind of symbolic thinking. So it all fits together. Our aim is to touch his imagination, to enthuse him to his inmost core. And then Mario says, storytelling comes first, then study. So I wrote a series of books, a universe story trilogy that tells the story of the universe. There are three books, Born with a Bang, From Lava to Life, Mammals Who Morph. So the first one is the first great story. The second one, or the story of the universe. The second one is the second great story, the story of life and the earth. The third, Mammals Who Morph, is a human story. So that's the third great story or theme. And they were illustrated by Dana Lynn Anderson, an extraordinary artist who lives here in California. And of course, a story, needs a storyteller. So my neighbor came over and she said one day, I'm gonna make this robe for you. And I said, oh, what? Are you kidding? And she says, yeah, I'm gonna make lights. We're gonna put stars all over it. And, and, I, and you need to use this. So I said, okay, whatever, oh, go ahead. So anyway, I, as soon as my books came out, I started getting a lot of invitations to Montessori schools and doing trainings and so on all over. 
So I wasn't going to do this, but Casey, right over there, <laughs> said you have to give them a little taste of storytelling. So I'm going to give you just a very little, little taste. So these, these stories are told in the voice of the universe. And I didn't bring any of my props or anything. I didn't bring the robe because I wasn't planning to do this. <laughs> But Casey said, you got to do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, okay. Um, all right, so for me to get into my universe voice, I don't have my thunder tube, so I'm going to ask you all to create some noise. And... <laughs> okay, wait, stop. I wasn't ready. <laughs> I'll tell you when to start. <laughs> And so you'll make some noise. And that was perfect, by the way. That was a really good rehearsal. Um, and uh, then I'll start, and this will be really, really short. <clears throat> My dear earthlings, you may not know me. I am the universe. And it's time for us to get to know each other. After all, I'm 14 billion years old now. And how old do you think you are? 10, 20, 50, 70? Oh no, you are 14 billion years old too. You are part of me. You have always been part of me from the very beginning. And that's why I'm going to tell you a story about me, which is a story about you too. Once upon a time, I was a tiny, tiny speck, smaller than a piece of dust under your bed. But I couldn't stay small. I blew, blew up to the size of a galaxy. I had to find exactly the right speed to grow, you know. If I grew just a little bit too quickly, I would have exploded and disappeared into nothingness. If I grew just a little bit too slowly, I would have collapsed and crushed into nothingness. But I found exactly the right speed to grow. Now, that's not to say that things were peaceful. Oh, no, there was chaos everywhere, glowing bolts of energy everywhere, and they collapsed into the very first things, the very first particles, the very first stuff. This stuff, these particles were floating around everywhere. There were protons and electrons, and they began to come together, and they turned into something amazing, the very first element. I'm talking about hydrogen. Was I proud of turning myself into the very first element, hydrogen? You bet I was. Thank you.
So you can see a shift in perspective from fragments to the whole, a radical sense of belonging, a zest for life comes out of that. It's a functional cosmology, which Thomas Berry talked about. And it, this is the capacity to build the noosphere. What Thomas Berry says, we will go into the future as a single sacred community or we perish. I just want to note that these two things came out at the very same time. Maria Montessori's To Educate the Human Potential in 1947 and chapter 10 of Teilhard's book, The Future of Man, about the noosphere in 1947. They didn't know anything about each other. Incredible, yeah. right? Um, I just want to give a plug for the American Teilhard Association. I'm on that board. It's a great organization. They're doing a lot of wonderful programs. My own organization, the Deep Time Network, we have members all over the world. Check it out. Uh, we have a Deep Time Leadership and Wellbeing Program, and, uh, which is a leadership program, nine months and three modules, and it's, it's transforming lives. It's just amazing. And so I will just close with this one quote, which is an adaptation of the Montessori quote <clears throat> uh, by Orla Hazra, who's on our board, the Deep Time uh, Network board. And you'll see the twist that she puts in there. She said, let's give the child a vision of the universe so that the child sees that it's the universe giving them the vision. Right? You got it. You got the twist there? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do we do Q&A now or is that later? What? After. After, okay. Although is the mic is not on, maybe just speak loudly. Today's my birthday, by the way. Uh, <laughs> And uh, hydrogen was, was very big in my life, so I wanted to take uh, maybe combine a couple things for, for both of you. Uh, oh, my name is Paul Carangella. I've known Brian for about a third of my life. I won't go into how old I am. Okay, now, as, as hydrogen was very big, I'm suggesting that you take two atoms of hydrogen and you add a certain amount of oxygen, I don't know how much, okay? And that becomes water. And I was baptized, all right? That's the connection then with my birthday and H2O, all right. Next, I taught a course with, with Brian about Eric Vogelin at CIIS, and we're dealing with memory, remembering. And um, my great uh, my kind of teacher was Eric Vogelin, who wrote a, a book called Anamnesis, uh, Remembering. And he was writing a letter to Alfred Schutz in 1943. And your work in sociology has to bring in some Alfred Schutz. Yes? Yes, good. And he, was rem he starts off by describing how uh, experiences he had as a child form the basis of excitement for questions that then he would be pursuing in his mature years. Okay. One of them was 
being brought into a shop with his mother, and there's a little boy, Eric, and he remembers her saying to the, the butcher, whoever it was, oh, he is, the word that he remembers, monate, which is months. So it must have been, he was maybe at most 14, 16 months old, but a mother would use monate. It was just that sound that he remembered, the monate. Okay, so that things with calendar. I'll now, I'll now go over to, uh, I have to say, wow, you mentioned Dabrowski. Yes. Wow. Well, I, you very rarely hear that name, uh, Dabrowski. Uh, and, and, and the theory of positive disintegration. Because you work a lot with maybe adolescents or trauma, with traumas and things like that. It's tremendous. Okay. Now for Jennifer, more, more directly, Oh, oh, am I allowed to give you a hug afterwards? Can I hug you later? Can I hug you later? Okay. All right. Because I'm going to mention uh, a person I've been working with for about 30 years. Uh, her name is, uh, she's children, writes children's books. Mary Pope Osborne and the Magic Treehouse series. All right. And, and children start reading these often with their parents before the age of six. And they're excited to know that they're starting to read chapter books. A whole new world opens up. And her main works are for children six and over. And they're filled with the cosmos, with animals, planets, great figures. In the magic dress, you, you, you do time travel. That's about it. I, 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 may, uh, I may stop there. I could go on and on. Uh, she's also read uh, world religions seen from the eyes of different children in different religions. It's before the Magic Tree House. Okay, at the University of North Carolina, they gave her uh, an honorary doctorate a number of years ago where she was a, a graduate. And this major scientist got, got, got awarded the, the uh, honorary degrees. And when she was introduced, the, the graduates stood up and gave her standing ovation because a lot of them had learned how to read by reading Magic Tree House. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. So we, we go from Paul to Peter. Thank you, Brian, and thank you both. Uh, this is for um, uh, you, Jennifer, because uh, as you know, uh, in Cleveland, we have um, three intergenerational schools that um, echo the, the spirit um, and the developmental approaches for the children of the Montessori method but continue the developmental thinking into older people. I guess you could say we got to mimic Eric Erickson and, uh, and celebrate generativity. Um, to me, it, the intergenerational aspect of education is, is really important. And I wonder if you could just comment on what you're seeing in the world with regards to bringing younger people and older people together to learn together. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Peter. I think that's absolutely crucial. And in alignment with, you know, Maria Montessori's idea about spiritual preparation of the teacher, I think there's the spiritual preparation of the grandparents. There's the spiritual thing that happens when the generations come together. And I've seen, you know, I've seen pictures, I've heard your talks about the intergenerational work, and I think it's absolutely invaluable. Um, and I see it also in the Montessori schools. I'm sure that Jana and <clears throat> Kyle can talk to this about bringing the grandparents in, bringing the extended family into the school so that uh, education doesn't only happen in the school. Education is happening in the family. It's happening out in the community. It's happening everywhere. So I think this intergenerational idea is absolutely crucial. Thank you so much for that, Peter. One last question, great. Hi, my name is Vasilisa Glauser. Hi to everyone who's virtual also. And I don't know your name, but he's ripe by bringing Dabrowski up in this group. Because one of the things about Dabrowski, most of us might be gifted and the gifted community really embraces that. So to everyone here, if for your own emotional landscape, if you look at that, I would recommend that. And my question to you all is, how do you see the arts playing in the education of the noosphere in today? It's 
it seems that, that the arts is the, the native language of, of, of the mind, isn't it? I, I, you're, you're asking about the arts, yes? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, I understand the arts as the native language of, of humanity. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> like what, what, how, how else could we, could we think about education? And, and, uh, and particularly in, the, in this context of, of positive disintegration, yes, that uh, positive disintegration for, for, for those of you who, who maybe not uh, be familiar with, with the term is in, in the context of why, what I was speaking, uh, you, you could think about it as as this you know like the bursting open of the of the closure that is that is kind of narrated identity you know social social thing that you have been you have been socialized into being yeah? and then you lose you lose it yes you, lo you 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 kind of remove yourself out of it in in which process uh, what happens with people and it's it's adolescents but it's also it's also ad adult people that that that, of, uh, that go through through this process it's often the case that you lose your language really you know like you 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 are not able to speak coherently anymore <laughs> because what uh, we, we are those those linguistic structures those symbolic structures are structures of meaning that are built of, of the usage of language. And when you stop believing, you know, the, 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 the type of you that you used to be before, uh, you, you want to get out of this language. You've got to get out of those forms. And then if we didn't have the art to express ourselves, you know, like what, what else would there be? You know? So be, before you, like you develop a new language, you know, that, that you actually, you know, like, you feel it's expressing that the deeper you, yeah, you, uh, yeah, you, uh, you, you start speaking some, some, something different, yes, which is kind of like more primordial, more, more humane, more universal, and, and I think that's the, the arts actually. So yeah, so it's like there, there cannot be education through this process without the, the arts, in my understanding. I would just follow up on that by saying when Maria, when Mario Montessori said storytelling first, then study, you could say art first, then study. Correct. And with, I was taught that Maria didn't have the arts in the schools traditionally because they were in the home so much in Italy. So she felt that the children would get it in the home, some of the arts. And for me, that's something, and I, I was trained Montessori actually. So, oh. uh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. um, or, yeah. And um, so I appreciate what you're doing. I do think that storytelling, like when you told your story, that was so powerful. And I think that's the arts teaching the noosphere in a very powerful way. So, thank exactly. You. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> we've, we've got a storyteller right over there, by the way, Mary Ellen. Uh, I don't know if it, if it was after Montessori, in his Cosmic Comics, translated to English, he's got a story about the expansion of the universe, in which everybody at the beginning is all tied up uh, in in a, in, a, in, a, in a almost infinitesimal point, and uh, and they're talking with one another. There's some kind of little family there, and and someone says, you know, can't we have any? Uh, the, the mother figure says, you know, maybe we should have some. Or the child said, let's have some pasta. And so what happens then is the universe explodes to present wheat and tomatoes and all that would make pasta. It's a wonderful short story by Italo Calvino. Thanks, thanks, Paul. All right, everyone, let's have a break. Let's, let's thank our speakers one more time. Wonderful.